all of the parties thinking they've got a chance to make a real impact here. The candidates here, I should just say, by the way, the format will be, we've got some uh, prepared questions which we'll uh, take from you from the audience, but I want you to be brave, I want you to be bold. When you hear a question being asked, and when you hear an answer being given from the stage, and you think, well, that candidate hasn't answered that question fully, or there's more I want to know about that answer, put your hand up, and we're going to make it as lively and as interactive as possible. You are going to make today a really fascinating listen for all of us. The candidates are in strict alphabetical order. Melanie Dudley from Labour, the Labour Party slogan to the many, not the few. Ian Flynn from the Liberal Democrats, their slogan, stop Brexit, build a better future. Mike Harrison from the Green Party, the Green slogan, say yes to Europe. And I'm sad to say that Marco Longhi, who is the Conservative candidate for Dublin North, is poorly today, he's unable to make it, but I am delighted to say that in his stead, the Ascent Councillor, Sean Kesey from Dudley Council, Sean representing the Conservatives today, their slogan, get Brexit done. Before we go to your questions, and we will crack on with that, the reason you saw me fiddling with my phone right at the start, not because I'm checking out the latest Twitter updates, I'm going to put a stopwatch on this. Each of the candidates has got one minute, no more, to, as we say, set out their stall. So I will do that in strict alphabetical order. Melanie Dudley for Labour, you have one minute starting now to set out your stall. Right, so first of all, I think the clue is in my name. My name is Melanie Dudley. That was the name I was born with. I was born in Dudley. Uh, grew up in Dudley. I didn't go to High Arkle. All of my lucky friends did, so they went to the predecessor of this school. Um, but I went to a, a school in the centre of Dudley, St James's Academy, so I know this area well. I was once sitting in the seats that you're sitting in now. I did train as a teacher and I taught for a few years, but you can't hold that against me. I'm not that bad, okay? Um, I've lived and worked locally my whole life. I did go off to university and I've had a great career. And that's my point. I want that for all of you too. You're all residents of Dudley North. You all have opportunities. You all have talents. I can't believe how immaculate you look, how well you behave, and I'm told the questions are really scary. I want to see that come to the potential. I want to pay back. I have had a good career. I have had a good life. So I want what you to have what I've had, and I want it for be, to be for the many and not for the few. Thank you very much Melody indeed. Dudley, thank you. And uh, next up, uh, Ian Flynn for the Liberal Democrats. Let me just stop my stopwatch so we're strict on the minutes. Uh, Ian Flynn for the Liberal Democrats. You have a minute starting now. So good morning and thank you very much for having me at your lovely school today. And I've been very impressed by um, what, what I saw this morning when I went around your, your classrooms. Um, I'm from Sully Hall in the West Midlands and I, I live in Dudley Borough. Uh, I've lived here for a number of years now. Um, and I'm very honoured to be standing as the Liberal Democrat candidate um, for Dudley North. Um, as Adrian has said, we, we, are, we are standing to uh, revoke Article 50, or at the very least put the deal Boris Johnson has uh, back to the people to remain or to accept his deal. Um, speaking to people in Dudley North, um, the issues for them are, are funding for the health service, for the police, uh, education and skills, uh, you are our future, um, and the vitality of our high streets. We, we, need, to, we need to properly tax e-commerce companies so they pay their fair share and our high streets uh, can thrive. We also need to fix youth homelessness. There are okay, too many people you. sleeping rough on Ian the streets. Flint, thank thank you. you for the Liberal Democrats. Thank you. Uh, next up, as I say, strict alphabetical order, uh, Mike Harrison from the Greens. Hello, I'm originally from New Zealand, but I've been living in the UK since 1989. Uh, I want you to think about uh, the jobs that you'll have when you grow up, the homes that you will live in when you grow up, and the planet that you will live on uh, when you grow up. And uh, there are problems with all of these things here in Dudley and around the world. We need to put a sharp handbrake 
on uh, our contributions to global warming and completely restructure our economy. Uh, but we can do this in a way that will provide you with good jobs, good warm homes, and uh, a safe planet to live on. Mike, thank you very much indeed. Uh, well in time, thank you. And uh, last but not least, as I say, uh, I won't keep repeating this, but Councillor Marco Longhi is unable to be with us. He is the uh, actually the candidate for Dudley North. In his stead, uh, you've got one minute, uh, Councillor Sean Keaton. Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Uh, firstly, um, let me apologise on Marco's behalf. He's very poorly. Uh, I was trying to talk to him last night on the phone, and uh, the conversation had to go through his wife <laughs> because he can't actually speak. So he does send his apologies, and he really wishes he could be here. Uh, Marco is from Walsall, so not too far away. Uh, he's a councillor in Walsall at the moment, and uh, for the last two years he was the mayor of Walsall. So he's a very experienced knowledgeable uh, local person. Myself, uh, I'm Sedgley, uh, brought up, don't boo, but I went to a school called Dormston, uh, a couple of, couple of hundred metres down the road. Um, my background is in music and performing arts. I went to university in Manchester uh, and I ended up being a teacher. Um, but I always really loved the entertainment industry, so I left teaching and I'm now the proud owner of a nightclub in Wolverhampton. Thank you. There you go. That's our four candidates, ladies and gentlemen. You heard there from uh, Sean Keezy for Marco Longhi, Mike Harrison, Melanie Dudley, and Ian Flynn. So let's kick off with your questions. Uh, Bethany Blaze from uh, Form 11 SPE. Do you like to stand up, Bethany? What's your question, Bethany? Over the last few years, we've seen an increase in mental health illness among young people. What plans does your party have to offer more support and care to young people with mental health problems? Okay, I'll start with you on that one, Sean. What uh, plans? And again, this, if you want to ask any questions around health, that's specifically a mental health question, which I know does impact uh, and is a real issue for many young people. But if you've got any questions on health, uh, this is the kind of part of the conversation where I'm encouraging you to put your hands up and throw them in. Uh, Sean, I'll throw that one to you then. What plans does your party have to offer more support and care to young people with mental health problems? Okay, well, first of all, let me put my hands up. I'm a local politician. I got elected last year. So some of the questions that you ask I may not have the answers to uh, that the other representatives have because they are uh, looking to be national politicians. Uh, in terms of mental health, obviously, in my opinion, as time has moved forward, um, issues have changed with people. When I was at school in the 1970s and the 1980s, the issues that we had to face are very different to the issues that you have to face today. And what I believe is that people should not be put in boxes. Everybody is an individual. When we were in the, um, uh, the, the green room early, we were talking about a young lad called Lewis who's uh, um, a gay lad, I think he's at one of your fellow academies over in Dudley, uh, an alter ego of Athena Hart, a drag queen. Uh, and I'm very proud uh, that I was one of two councillors in Dudley last year that organised the authority's very first event to celebrate International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia. And what I believe is a cons as a Conservative is that we need to ensure that everyone is treated as an individual and everyone is supported with the issues that they've got. And I hope that answer, Adrian, is okay. Uh, well, it's your answer. I'm not sure it addressed the question <laughs> about uh, what the party would do to help support and care for young people with mental health problems. Melanie. Um, thank you, Bethany. I think mental health is the most important issue for young people because if your mental health is good, then you can achieve so many other things, academically, sports-wise, and socially. If not, if you're feeling isolated, if life is tough, then everything becomes an effort. What the Labour Party want to do is, at the moment, the only when people get to really extreme cases of suicide or threatened suicide do they get any help. You go to your doctor, you go to your you know, people in the community, and they really can't access help. What we are going to do is invest more in help in communities. 
in your school, I know there will already be mentor systems and friendship groups where you are actually supporting each other. We want to put more money into that. So as soon as you start to feel less than well, you will actually get support at that stage because if you think about it, by the time you've fallen off the cliff, the ambulance is going to cost a lot of money to scrape you up and make you better again. We need to stop you feeling bad in the first place and that is about addressing the very very early stages of mental health so we will put our money into large numbers of initiatives in the community much quicker access so that you don't get to feel as poorly as the people you do see around you who really are struggling and can't get the good jobs can't have good lives because their mental health is too poor Melanie, thank you. Ian Flint for the Liberal Democrats. Yeah, so the, the Liberal Democrats have been campaigning for, for a number of years now on, on um, mental health issues and for more funding for, for mental health. Uh, Norman Lamb, for example, um, uh, is, is well known for, for the work he's done to, to promote, promote that um, in Parliament. Um, I think we're seeing, unfortunately, um, because of the lack of funding for public services over the last 10 years, we, we, we've been seeing uh, the police um, picking up more mm. of the, the, the burden of supporting those with mm. mental health issues and unfortunately um, people who shouldn't be are ending up in the criminal justice system. Um, another issue is if you walk the streets of, of Dudley or uh, of Birmingham or even, even the smaller towns like Stourbridge, um, you're seeing people, young people under 25 sleeping on the streets and they're there for a number of reasons but some of those issues may be underlying mental health issues. Uh, we're the fifth richest country in the world and we should be doing a lot better uh, on mental health and, and other issues like adult social care, your grandparents, your parents in the future. Okay, Ian Flint, thank you. Mike Harrison for the Greens. Uh, kids these days are under a huge amount of pressure. Um, there's a lot of pressure from social media and uh, I don't don't know if I can ask you to put away your phone sometimes. The other uh, big issue is pressure from schools and pressure to do really well so that you can get that great job. And of course, it, it is good to have high aspirations for your education, but mm, it, 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 you don't want to be hit over the head all the time. <laughs> Um, the other thing that uh, we really need is a lot more spending on um, uh, services for young people's mental health, like CAMS. Thank you. Okay, Mike, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Bethany, does that answer your question? It does. Uh, any other questions around health, mental health issues uh, yet? Sorry, just wait a second. Um, yeah, if you want to stand up, yeah. What will you do to help people with different types of mental health issues? Okay, thank you. And then there's a young chap at the front here, Just here. People are too scared to like reach out on um, mental illness and people are just suffering in the background. What can you do about that? Okay. Uh, I'll throw that to you then, Mike. People are sometimes too scared to be, seek help. Yeah. That was the question. And, and the different kinds of areas of mental health was addressed by the young lady. Uh, First of all, I, I forgot to, uh, actually to say that there are resources in this school um, to help you if you're feeling pressure. So please do, do, do avail yourself of those. Go and uh, talk to um, the, the uh, teachers who are uh, available to you. Um, different kinds of mental health. Well, one of the most important things is to uh, get somebody to actually listen to you, listen seriously to you. Um, and I spent a bit of time volunteering as um, a skilled listener for cruise bereavement care. Uh, so um, we need to make sure that there is adequate funding to uh, have enough people to listen skillfully to you with your issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ian Flynn then, the different kinds of mental health uh, where, where spending needs to be focused and the importance of reaching out and seeking help. 
Yeah, the, 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 we're, we're all different, we're all unique, and, uh, and, and there are many different kinds of, of mental health issues affecting people of different ages from different places. So it's difficult to, to give one silver bullet answer to that, but if, if we do restore a level of public funding to what we've, mm. we've had in past years, then all these great organizations out there, people like the Samaritans, people like the Citizens Advice Bureau, who, who help and support people can better resource their facilities. For example, in, in Dudley Borough, the Citizens Advice Bureau, who, who gives very important advice to people in trouble, um, that you have to go now to Dudley Town Centre to get that support where a few years ago you could get it locally. And if people are in, in difficulty um, and they don't have any support like that, then you know it, it can bring on um, mental health issues. Um, so uh, I think overall restoring funding back to, to um, levels of previous years, um, we, we can tackle mental illness on, on a number of levels from a number of, of, of directions. Okay, Ian, thank you, Melanie, for Labour. Um, can I first of all say thank you for what is a very, well, two very sophisticated questions in different ways. So when we talk about different types of mental health, we could be talking about something like autism, we could be talking about depression, we could be talking about anxiety. They need very, very different treatments and we, and we use mental health as this catch-all that's not really very helpful. What we need to do is to invest more money in people understanding them. I am very proudly got a, a neurodivergent, she's very keen on, on that label, member of my campaign team, she's autistic. She does fantastic work, she has a particular set of skills. Um, we work with those skills rather than trying to work against them and make them fit into a box that they don't fit into. In the same way with depression, there are certain things like exercise and diet, positive uh, social environments. Very, very different treatments for very different types of mental health problems. And then, can I come to your point about reaching out? Everybody should feel able to reach out. I can sit here today and say to you, I have reached out. Two years ago, my mom died. I needed help, and I am not ashamed to say that I reached out for it. Not always is it something as big and as life-changing as that. Please do reach out. We will do our very best in a school like this. They will bend over backwards to try and give you the support you need. Do not be ashamed. I sit here as a parliamentary candidate saying to you, I needed to reach out and I did it. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Uh, Sean, for the Conservatives. Believe it or not, I agree with everything Melanie's just said. Uh, mental health does not come in a box. Uh, every single person has got different issues and mental health can come from both internal uh, and external uh, stimuli. It can have you, whether you've got money worries, uh, whether you've got problems at home, mental health comes in many different forms. And what we have to do as politicians is make sure that the structures are in place so that you are supported when you need it. When you need to reach out to someone, we need to make sure that there is someone there for you to reach out to. And that comes with funding and it comes with supporting schools and making sure that there are really good quality teachers in place to support you when you need it. Thank you. Okay, and thank you for asking those questions. I do appreciate it and want to encourage that kind of boldness. That's brilliant. Uh, let's move on to education now. Deanne. I think it's got a question. Hi, Diane. Um, what are your um, plans with tuition fees and how you ensure that people from any background can um, afford to go to university? Okay, thank you, Diane. Uh, so this is the, uh, the area of education. What are your plans for tuition fees? How will you ensure that people from any background can go to university? Do you want to start on that, uh, Mike Harrison, for the Greens? Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, we would abolish tuition fees. Secondly, uh, going to university is important, but we also need to look to countries like Germany where there are routes to um, high technical uh, learning that are available to people. So I would encourage people to, to go on to get higher and further education and some of that will be appropriate to do at university, and some of that will be appropriate to do at technical college. Thank you. Uh, Mike, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Ian Flynn for the Liberal Democrats. Of course, your party, when in coalition 
with the Conservatives, finally backtracked on a pledge not to introduce tuition uh, fees. So what are your plans uh, should your party be in government on this occasion. So you're absolutely right, Adrian. Yes, the Liberal Democrats campaigned uh, in 2010 to uh, not to have um, tuition fees. Um, we then went into a coalition with the Conservatives, uh, and we actually did, with the Conservatives, introduce tuition fees. Um, not everybody was happy with that in the, in the party, and um, we took the took the blame for that policy. Um, it was policy we introduced with the Conservatives. Um, I don't think there is any plan to um, uh, ab abolish the tuition fees in the current manifesto. Um, I may be wrong, but I, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, however, what, what about you personally, Ian? Is that something you'd be pushing for? Or, I mean, the, the, the second part of the question is, how will you ensure that people from any background can go to university? I think, I think that the, when it was introduced, it was made sure that it would be, um, it would be affordable for those... Um, um, who, who are at least able to, af to afford it. Um, the, the policy is introduced. Um, me personally, um, I went to university and, and had a, a very good experience. Um, and I don't, I don't think we should make our young people um, pay for uh, tuition in Scotland. Um, they, they don't uh, do that. Um, and we could have something else like a, a a taxation system that, that taxes graduates, uh, which I think would be fairer, but um, that's just my personal opinion. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I do I do regret that our our young people um, leave university with with large debts. Um, and as as Mike said, there are other routes to um, getting qualifications. There's high level apprenticeships coming in, which are another route um, to to uh, to a high high skill set. Um, Okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, Sean, then, uh, your party, along with the Liberal Democrats, <coughs> introduced tuition fees. Um, so what are your plans? Should that continue? And, and if they do continue, is that any barrier to people from deprived backgrounds going to university? Well, I think we need to put to bed the myth that uh, you, you can only go to university if you're from one background or another. Mm. It's blatantly untrue. Anybody can go to university. If you want to go to university, you can. The facilities are there. Um, I don't believe that there are any plans in the party to change tuition fees to lower them. Uh, but we've got to be realistic. More and more people are going to university. When I was young, I went to university, and back then you got a grant. I think I've got about £400 per term uh, to live on. Now, the grant was slightly higher, but uh, I had a mum and dad who were both teachers, so we were, we were classed as well off, so I didn't quite get the full grant. But what I would say is, when you leave school at 16, some people don't want to go to university. They will go out and get jobs um, or look for another kind of way to move their life forward. Apprenticeships is one way. Um, but for the people that are going to university, uh, the question I ask is, where is the money going to come from to pay for it? Because what you'll hear today is people saying, well, we'll, borrow, we'll pay for this and we'll pay for that and we'll get more funding for this and more funding for that. But at some point, there is no more money for funding. Personally, I would love to say to you that everything in life is free. Universe, everything. But we can't, unfortunately. There is a limit to the money that's available. So I believe that for tuition fees should stay, but what I would say is that I believe the interest rates um, for when tuition fees are due to be paid back are too high. Mm. They should be very, very low, almost mm. interest-free, and they should only be paid back when they can be afforded. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, thank you. Sean Melanie. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Deanne, the very simple answer to your question is we're going to scrap them, okay? So there will be no tuition fees going forward. Um, I can comment on Sean's uh, thing about, well, where does this money all come from? Trust me, if you go to university and you get a good job and you get a good career, you will be paying in taxes 
to fund the future children, your children, the next generations. So it's not that this is free, it's just that we skill people up, we give them opportunities, and then they pay back into the system. Mm. And that, we think, is the fairest way. The people mm. who have the best chances, get the most money, then pay to, to pay that forward to other people. In terms of universal access, we had something called the Education Maintenance Allowance because one of the big problems for young people of your age is what do you do between 16 and 18? It's a really hard time. You could leave school, you could be on an apprenticeship, you could be getting some money, or you stay at school, there's no money. An Education Maintenance Allowance gives you, in, the, in the, the previous system, it was 30 pounds a week that was money that allowed you to stay in school. We are looking to restore that, and I think that would be extremely important as well. I do agree that university is not for everybody, but what I would say is great opportunities are for everybody, mm. and we are looking to provide them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Melanie. Can I just uh, get a little show of hands? from the audience there, except we've got a, 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 a range of ages here. Not everybody might be about to go to university. I will take one or two of you, your comments as well. But obviously with your tuition fees, if you go to university, the amount you earn dictates how much you pay back or the rate at which you pay back. So if you're a low earner, you pay back less. If you're below a certain threshold, you don't pay anything. If you earn more, you pay back more. Bearing that in mind then, just a show of hands, how many of you would be deterred from going to university by the prospect of having tuition fees? Show of hands if you would be deterred from going. Yeah, a few of you, probably uh, one in 10, I'd say, roughly, just as a, as a general guide. There were some questions over here on that subject. Um, so, young lady in the middle there, yeah. Just first a sec, sorry. So if you pass it afterwards to your colleague on either side as well, that'd be good. So you're saying you're going to increase taxes for, like, when we're older? Uh, okay, so that's your... Yeah, go on. Go on to mm, what are you going to do about the decrease of attendance in, child, in children? Okay, and that's... Sorry, and this, uh, um, if you're going to keep tuition fees, is there any fairer way to, like, spread them out or spread the costs so that it appeals to different, like, generations in the future? Okay, thank you very much indeed. So, um, quickly on those then. So, Melanie, uh, the suggestion from one young lady, effectively all you're doing is going to increase taxes when people go to university, go and earn money later on. Yeah, I, I don't think I explained that one well, very well. So, thank you for <coughs> giving me the opportunity to clarify. What I actually mean is if you earn £50,000 and you pay 35% tax on that £50,000, you will pay more than if you're earning £20,000 and you pay 20% tax. So that was my point. It wasn't about the fact that we will actually look to extra low tax, but just by definition, the more you earn as a percentage, you pay a certain percentage of your, your money as, as, as tax, as, of your salary as tax, and if you earn more, you pay more. Uh, going on to the point about uh, attendance of children, we need to understand why children are not attending. Um, are there home circumstances as to why they're not attending? Uh, are there, there issues at school as to why they're not attending? And we really need to work with those children to say, what can we do to improve your situation? So that would be my answer to that one. Okay, we'll stick with the tuition fees, uh, if we may. So, uh, Sean, uh, you said tuition fees would stay. You, you don't see any alternative to that. There's no magic money tree, as uh, mm -hmm. Theresa May Or forest. <laughs> Before giving a billion pounds to the DUP. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Look, would, I'm would, a local I'm politician, Adrian. Would you, would, you, would you change the way in which tuition fees are paid? I, I'm not sure, because if you go to university, you shouldn't be looking backwards, in my opinion. You should be looking forwards. And it doesn't matter which one of you are at university. Once you've been and you've at obtained your qualification, your, 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 um, your future is there for you, and it doesn't matter whether you come from what you would class as a rich background or a poor background. The opportunity is there for you to go and get a really, really good job. I mean, I went to school in Great Bridge. My dad was head of a school in Great Bridge, and many, many of my classmates from Great Bridge stroke Tipton are in fantastic jobs now, and they really, really push themselves. Uh, and I think, looking forwards, 
the opportunity is there for everyone. Everyone pays the same fees back once they can achieve it. And the one thing I'll say finally, Adrian, uh, if you don't mind, is that we've talked about tuition fees and having to pay, but remember, none of this is free. So someone always has to pay for it, whether it's taxpayers, whether it's paying back your tuition fees, none of it is really free. Okay, thank Sean, thank you. Mike, quick point, please. Taxpayers are us. So if we want stuff, we can have it, but we have to pay for it. Uh, and uh, places like Sweden have much higher tax rates uh, than we do, and they have a um, uh, higher welfare system. So uh, I, I don't think there's any problem in admitting that we would uh, increase taxes for people who are better off. Okay. A Ian, quick point. I think um, the university sector was expanded greatly um, initially under the Labour government. Um, they wanted to push up the numbers going to university. Um, in, in recent years, um, I think higher level apprenticeships have broadened the opportunities for, for young people um, and you can now actually achieve some of those qualifications without actually having to go to university. You can do it while you're working and, and skill up on the job and I think, I think that's, that's something to be, to be welcomed. So for those who are um, worried about um, tuition fees, I, I would suggest you look at the apprenticeship system and the high level apprenticeship system and the, and the opportunities that can provide. Okay, Ian, thank you. Um, next question, we're turning to votes at 16 now. Uh, Molly Jarrett, Molly, you're there. Young people are allowed to join the army and fight for our country, but we're not allowed to vote for the people who send us to war. We're allowed to get a job and pay taxes, but we're not allowed to vote for the people who decide how those taxes are gonna be spent. At the age of 16, we're allowed to have children, so why are we not allowed to vote? Okay, Molly, thank you. Uh, do you want to start off with that one, Mike? Uh, should 16-year-olds have the vote? Sure, yes. We believe that 16-year-olds should definitely have the uh, vote. Uh, hopefully, they will be well-informed votes. Um, but then again, many adults don't uh, aren't very well-informed. Uh, I think also that uh, people of age 16 shouldn't be able to join the army. Uh, at the moment, you separate, can... Separate question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yes, short answer is yes, 16-year-olds should have the vote. Okay, Mike, thank you. Ian Flynn, Liberal Democrat. Yes, 100, 110%, yes, I think 16-year-olds should be allowed to vote, of course, because the decisions we're making now will affect mm. your future going forward, not... Yeah. Not your grandparents, or not, not some, well, a little people like me, but, but, you know, it's your future, so, yes. Yeah, Melanie for Labour. Um, yeah, um, Molly, actually, you answered your own question extremely well. You, you can work, you can have children, you can join the army, you can fight for the country. Why should you not have a say in the future? You absolutely should. Also, there are things like that dready B word, the Brexit word, People who have voted for that are not going to live to see the consequences. You will see the consequences of something you haven't been able to vote for. That is fundamentally wrong. Uh, Sean, for the Conservatives. OK, may not be the most popular opinion, but no, I think the voting age should remain at 18. <coughs> the reason why? Because at 16, you leave school. You've spent most of your entire life in school. You haven't been out into the wide world. As you quite rightly said, you haven't joined the army. You haven't gone out and got a job. You haven't had the fantastic experience at university. Now, we've all been 16. We've all been 18. And I remember back to when I was 16 and I left Dormston. It was all school. And all I listened to in politics was my mum and dad arguing. When I went to university, I saw the big wide world. I listened to many views. I listened to many opinions and I was allowed to formulate my own and I feel that at the age of 18 you have got enough life experience to make an educated and self-chosen choice. Thank you, okay. Adrian. Uh, Sean, thank you. Uh, I'll do a quick show of hands on this. Obviously, I appreciate there's a number of uh, youngsters in this room who are not yet 16. Some of you will be, I'm thinking. Uh, but show of hands then, who thinks 16-year-olds should get the votes? And who thinks 16-year-olds shouldn't get the vote? 
Right. Big majority, overwhelmingly in favour. Individuals, of six, Adrian. Of 60, you know, I, was getting that. I, was just, I was just infected. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to uh, local issues. Uh, Fraser <coughs> Cadman from 7BT8. Fraser. Over the past few years, Dudley has seen the closure of youth clubs, swimming baths and community centres, but houses are being built all over the area. Is the increasing population of young people expected to hang around on the streets for entertainment? Oh, thank you very much indeed, Fraser. Now, Sean, a couple of times you've said, well, look, I'm a local councillor. I'm mm -hmm. not a national politician. But this does touch very much on your patch as a local councillor, but also with the national view. We've had austerity, mm. reducing the money available for local councils. We've had local mm. councils implementing what they've sometimes regarded as quite tough decisions. But the net result is what Fraser is talking about. Youth clubs, swimming baths, community centres closing down. At the same time, more and more houses are being built. What are young people supposed to do for entertainment? Okay, uh, sorry, was it Fraser? Yep. I totally agree. Um, yes, there has been austerity, but personally I believe that sometimes the wrong decisions have been made and money needs to be put into facilities for young people, and that means youth clubs and swimming baths. And believe it or not, locally, us councillors fight for that each and every day. One of my colleagues in Sedgley uh, fought very hard to get a youth centre reopened in Sedgley, uh, quite recently so yes I totally agree with you more money should be available and we will be fighting to make sure it is thank you Fraser uh, Ian Flynn is, if new housing estates are built I, I know that something that this sounds a bit technical forgive me something called section 106 money so when new estates are built or new, big new housing developments local councils can say to the developer in return for allowing you to build on this land we want some money that we can then put into local facilities. Is that sometimes underused when new estates are built? And enough, you know, so that more facilities should be being built on the back of those housing estates? I think it's uh, remaining fairly technical, but I, I think it can be difficult for local authorities with, with Section 106 agreements. Uh, developers can be a little slippery sometimes mm. and, and can try and get away with. Um, so when you build houses, you, 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 have to put, you have to pay for the new roads or you have to help pay for the new roads. You have to help pay for local facilities like um, you know, youth centres and libraries, those kind of things. You have to, you have to put some money into the community. Um, but some developers are, are quite slippery mm. and try and pay as little as they can for that. Maybe, maybe the local authorities need more powers to, to, to make those developers mm reward the community for, for developing those, those homes uh, in, in the local area. I think also locally we can be more ambitious. Um, the Commonwealth Games uh, is coming to, to Birmingham and I, I think this area perhaps could have, could have bid for more and, and on the back of that created some new facilities for, for the borough. We, we could perhaps have, have tried to get a velodrome um, for, for this area. Um, that's an opportunity that was perhaps missed so you know there are more things we can do and, and, and certainly library services, uh, youth clubs, those kind of things, we, we, we need to support them. Um, I'm a father of a small child and, and my, my wife is a regular with our daughter user of local facilities um, and you know mums need, need support, they need those facilities in the local community and as, as kids get older uh, I'm sure I'm going to find out my daughter um, you know, she, she, she needs more things to do with her friends, so... Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Melanie? Yeah, I think, uh, Fraser, you're exactly right. The, the fact that we youth services have been cut, the fact that we, swimming pools are being closed, all those sorts of things, is fundamentally wrong. We complain as older people, and I, I'm afraid I do class everybody on, the, uh, on the, the platform as being an older person. We complain, you look at your phones and you, your iPads and whatever. What the heck else are you supposed to do? There really isn't anything else for you to do. That drives an increase in mental health problems, there's an increase in knife crime, there's an increase in drugs, because those are the only social groupings that are available. This is fundamentally wrong. I do agree greatly with Sean that actually locally, politicians of whatever colour do fight very, very hard for local facilities. So get on to your local uh, politicians argue with us. When I was responsible, I used to be responsible for the whole of all services, including 
uh, everything from schools to, to um, adult care in an area, 1% of the budget was spent on youth services, but it had a positive effect on thousands and thousands of young people. That 1% has gone now. It's wrong. It needs to be put back. Uh, is there a young lady with a comment there? Yes? Have we got a microphone for the young lady there, please? <coughs> um, talking about local issues, what are you going to do about, like, recently there's been p children around the school that are being kidnapped and, like, shoved in vans and stuff. What is the, lo like, the party's going to do about that? Okay, I'll come, I'll, I'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, Mike, answer this specific question about what young people <coughs> are expected to do around areas of entertainment if the local youth club is closed down? When I was a kid, um, I would be, um, I would leave the home at, in the morning and spend all day in the bush and then <laughs> come back home. Now these opportunities are often not available to young people here. Uh, I very much hold the last 10 years of austerity responsible. The budgets for councils have been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. The councils would love to spend more on you, but if it's a choice between a skate park or sending people around to look after elderly people in their own homes, it's a really, really <coughs> tough choice to make. Uh, but uh, we, we, there is, we live in a very wealthy country. We need to ask who is hoovering up all the money. Uh, so there is money available and it should be spent on youth services. Instead, it gets spent scraping up the uh, accident at the bottom of the cliff. Thank you. Okay, Mike, thank you. Uh, young lady, uh, forgive me, I'm going to move on from your question just because I know that the school worked very hard to encourage people to send in questions in advance and there's some big issues that we want to address that people have submitted questions for and I'm conscious of the clock as well. Um, uh, Jamie Causa, hello Jamie. So what do you think the effect of Brexit will be on Dudley and why do you think the people of Dudley voted for Brexit? Okay, uh, thank you. And I should say by the way, if you do want to raise that question with the candidates later, by all means mm -hmm. do come and have a, Please, a chat with them, that sounds very important and serious. Um, so uh, what do you think the effect of Brexit will be on Dudley and why do you think the people of Dudley voted for Brexit? Mike Harrison for the Greens. Uh, the EU, sort of, a bit that way, a bit that way. The Green Party as a whole is very enthusiastic about Europe. I'm somewhat less enthusiastic about it, but I still think that it's better to be in than out. Question. The question Sorry. is, what do you think the effect of Brexit will be on Dudley and why do you think the people of Dudley voted for Brexit? Uh, I think it will make the people of Dudley poorer and I think that um, there were uh, probably a lot of issues uh, surrounding people's uh, choices there, but one of them was the terrible pack of lies that the Conservative Party, especially Boris Johnson, um, put on the side of the bus and the way that that was taken up by the right-wing media that supported Johnson. Okay, so by that, the, for people who may not know this, there was a, a bus used in an advert in the Brexit campaign which spoke of 350 million, million. million a, a week, week being available to the NHS, which otherwise was going to Brussels. Whereas we're going to be like at least 50 million so, well, a week uh, worse off. Sean uh, Kesey, can I uh, get you to respond to that particular point, <coughs> the, the pack of lies that uh, the Conservative Party told, and this broader question of the effect of Brexit on Dudley and why local people voted for Brexit? Brexit. Hmm. Boo, bane of our lives, right. A pack of lies. I'm going to be an individual now. I'm going to speak for me. Both the Remain side and the Leave side, in my opinion, ran the worst, most negative campaigns you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. Yes, I don't know whether the figure on the side of the bus was right or wrong. Some people say it was, some people say it wasn't. But on the other side of the argument, if you remember, the day we voted to leave, the whole economy was going to collapse. We'd be in recession, emergency budgets. It was all scaremongering nonsense. And I condemn both sides for not selling a positive vision 
of what they believe the country would look like if they would. Okay, In terms so of your Dudley, chance, then the effect of Brexit on Dudley, what right. will it be and why do you think Leave Dudley back? Right, in terms of Dudley, Dudley will carry on doing what Dudley does. We're going to invest £30 million in a new Dudley Leisure Centre and refurbishing Stourbridge and Hales Owen. That will carry on. I'm part of a working party that we're looking to try and build a 4,000-seat arena and entertainment venue in Dudley. That will carry on. We will still fill the potholes. We will still look after the people we need to. Why did people in Dudley vote to leave? Personally, I think because people in Dudley thought, no one's listening to us and it's time that we had our say. My opinion on uh, why we left and why I voted to leave, nothing to do with Europe. I love Europe, don't like the EU. The reason? Because I can't vote for people that are making decisions that affect my life. President Tusk, I can't vote for him. President Juncker, I can't vote for him either. Maybe if I could, my vote would have been different. I'm not bothered about immigration, none of that nonsense. It's all for me about democracy and accountability. Thank okay, you. Sean, thank you. Melanie? Um, I think the first thing we have to say about Brexit is I would ask for a show of hands. Are you fed up to the back teeth with hearing about Brexit? Put your hands up if you are, because I'll put mine up now. <laughs> I've got both of mine. <laughs> right, OK. I mean, virtually everybody in the room. Uh, right. <laughs> and, and I think that's the first thing that we have to say. This has gone on for far too long and it's been complete and utter nonsense. I do think that people in Dudley North voted uh, to leave the EU because it felt very remote from them and they couldn't see what it offered them. That could be about reality. That could be about communication. That's how they felt in 2016. What I will not allow to happen is Boris Johnson's let's get Brexit done deal go ahead because what I will tell you is in Dudley North there will be less jobs um, there will be no workers rights so prove it go wrong. prove it you can't say it prove it I am allowed to answer the question yes but you you're just making me. statements uh, prove think, them right, I'm terribly sorry I didn't interrupt you I don't expect you to interrupt me well. we have good manners here uh, there will be less jobs uh, there will be less workers' protections, that is actually written into the agreements that have gone to the second reading in the House of Commons. Both of those are facts in there, and there are none of the environmental protections and the pursuit towards carbon uh, emission lowering in 2030 to 2050. If you want the evidence of this, and I'm very happy to come back and uh, give it to your principal, it is in the second reading of the bill that actually the Tories abandoned when they prorogued Parliament for this general election. And I am very happy to give you that evidence. Um, Ian, from a Liberal Democrat point of view, here you are standing in Dudley North. You're standing in one of the most pro-leave parts of the country. And the Liberal Democrats are standing on a manifesto, not only to have a second referendum, but if you were to be the main party to actually revoke Article 50 to stop Brexit in its tracks. Do you think that's got any traction in a, an area like this? Why do you think people in Dudley voted for Brexit and might now suddenly have changed their mind so dramatically as to vote for that Liberal Democrat policy? I, I think there are plenty of people in Dudley North and Dudley Borough who wish to remain in the EU. They know we are richer in the EU, we are stronger in the EU. We retain our jobs and our influence. We're a, a, we're a great country, but we're a small country. It's a different time now than the 1970s. The world has changed. There's, China's very powerful. The United States isn't reliable. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. And working closely together with our partners, our neighbors in Europe, makes a lot of sense. Um, I appreciate, yes, the, the, the vote in 2016 was, was heavily in favor of leaving. People voted for that for a variety of reasons. But hey, people are allowed what, to change what were, their... What were they? What's your analysis? Why did people in Brexit, in Dudley, vote for Brexit? Well, pe some people were unhappy with, with the government. Some people were unhappy about immigration and the way it was explained to them. Um, people people were, set, were, set, were, were given simplified messages about things that were far more complicated. Uh, and social media has been abused to, to um, portray messages that aren't true. And well, I'm I'm sure, I'm Sean's, Sean's made a point, hasn't he, that there are people at the top of the European Union 
President Juncker, for example, he, he said, mm. he, he couldn't vote for, that there was a lack of democratic accountability in the European Union. Mm. Isn't that a fair point? Well, perhaps we have to concede a little bit of, of, of that sovereignty to, to attain peace, stability, and, and, and a, a wealthier society. Um, that's a price perhaps it's worth paying. But what I would like to say, Adrian, is that we shouldn't be having a general election now. We should be having a vote on the, the deal that Boris Johnson says he has or remaining in the EU. That's what we should be doing now, not having this election where the main issue gets confused with all kinds of other things. Go on, Mike. You've got your finger raised there. Uh, yeah, I think the EU certainly needs a lot of uh, reform, uh, democratic reform. Um, I hate the way it crushed Greece. And uh, I think Sean's point about uh, being able to uh, vote for the president uh, is a really good one. You'd like to see the change work from within rather than from without. Yes. There's a young lady there. Before I bring you in, uh, madam, can I just check? Is this about Brexit? Is your question about Brexit? Yes? Can we get the microphone just, just to make a comment? That lady there, please. In your opinion, uh, which one's better for us to stop Brexit or to carry on with it? where we are yeah, now. From where okay. we are. In a word, Melanie? I think we have to negotiate a new deal and then put that to the people alongside do you want to stay. That has to happen in the next six months and we sort it. <laughs> that was more than one word. Uh, Ian? <laughs> if, if we get a majority of 326 uh, in Parliament, we will revoke uh, Article 50. If not, we will push for uh, a vote on Boris Johnson's deal or remaining as, as we are. Mike? New people's vote. Shaking your head, Sean, go on, the microphone doesn't pick oh, up. I, I feel like banging my head on the table. We had a democratic vote in 2016. Whether you agreed with it or not, leave one. We have to leave the European Union. That's it. Otherwise... We can change our minds as a country. Yes, we it's can. Not a, it's yes, not we, a, we can. Maybe in 20 or 30 years, not three years later. Are we, are we a democracy or not? Otherwise, if we have another referendum... Should it and remain win, should we say, well, actually, we need a third one, best of three. Now, best of five, best of ten. We'll be here forever. Democracies, okay. democracies <laughs> ask people's opinions. The so deal, the de no, so I haven't finished. Vote, I haven't okay? finished. I haven't finished. We have spent, <laughs> we have spent three years going on and on and on about Brexit, and now finally there is a deal. Your party's wasted which, three hey, years. Please, come on. There's a deal, it's a good deal, and the Conservative Party will implement the deal and we'll be on our way. The Labour Party will take us backwards and we'll negotiate another deal, and then the Labour Party will not campaign for the deal they've negotiated. It's ridiculous. Sean, uh, thank you very much indeed. Well, I tell you what, I, I reckon we could go on for another hour, but I think the interim principle won't allow us to do that. But I've had great fun and know that all of That's our it. candidates uh, here today will have done. So well could done, I thank well you, done, you. Uh, and thank you for your yeah. very intelligent, very well-reasoned questions and for also for your close attention in listening to the answers. So yeah, can we thank, thank you? you. And can I also thank uh, Sukjot for inviting me here. It's yeah. the second time I've done one of these uh, election time debates uh, at this school. Um, and I think every school should have one. It's yeah. brilliant. And not every school Absolutely. does. Not many schools do. So you are very privileged to have this, but you've entered fully into the spirit. So without any further ado, can I ask you to thank the Green Party candidate in Dudley North, Mike Harrison. Sean Kesey. What stand, about the climate? Sean Kesey standing in for the uh, Conservative Party candidate, Marco Longhi. Thank you, everyone. Climate, climate was next on my list, Mike. Uh, Melanie Dudley, the Labour candidate. And Ian Flynn, the Liberal Democrat candidate. And uh, thank you to all of you. I've really enjoyed thank it. Thank you. Bye-bye. One last, one last thing, one last thing, one last... Go on, I've got, I've got to do it then. I've got to do it. If there was an election...
Guys, if there was an election today, who, if there was an election today, who would vote for Mike Harrison from the Green Party? <laughs> oh, there was a fellow there, Mike. I think it's good. Who would vote for Sean or his uh, friend Marco Longhi, the Conservative candidate? Okay, there's a, a, de a decent showing. Who would vote for Melanie Dudley, the Labour candidate? <laughs> You're making more noise. I'm not sure it's still, it's way for thin. Who would vote for Ian Flynn, the Liberal Democrat candidate? There's a few, there's a few, all right. It's going to be way for thin in this classroom, in this uh, hall, as it is in Dudley North. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. He said, now that you're with me, well, I think that you should stay. Yeah, I know you've been busy searching through the city, so.